Hello, everyone. Welcome to another awesome day of FM Maker Training. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of FMTrain.tv, where every day we are having a lot of fun doing lots of great training. So today is going to be day two of FileMaker Go. Today's going to be awesome. We haven't talked about this specific topic in years with an S. And so it's going to it's going to be if yesterday was valuable, today will be even more so if you're doing FileMaker Go. We have a sample, a free sample file for you. No charge whatsoever. Just, just provide your credit card at nine ninety five for shipping and handling right now. It's uh, legitimately totally free. If you want to support the stream, since it's totally free and we're at more free software, we recommend that you there we go. click the bundle button. There we go. And this is where you can support the channel for those of you who believe in supporting the channel. Encourage Margaret to do a good job and to show up to work. Then that's how we do it. So today's conversation, Margaret, we're going to transfer command and then you're going to manage the the squealing. So let's talk about what is going on. So this is the FileMaker Go training tool. We created this when FileMaker Go first came out. And so what this is, is that part of this is running, for those of you who can see me in real life, I'm running the one on my iPad. You can see it here. So if I if I move the screen, can I move the screen? I hit overview. There we go. So that is uh, me being able to do things. I haven't played with this in an awful long time. Um, and so these are all the issues and all the things that you should consider when developing a solution for FileMaker Go. And it also says WebDirect 2 on here, so we worked on this. Now, it was designed for FileMaker 19. I don't know that that much has changed in the product because Claris has been investing pretty heavily in Pro and Server. The idea is that there's not a lot of new features on Go. In WebDirect, what Claris just tries to do is remove the friction points. Yesterday, we talked about friction points like sandpaper or a whole room full of these little knives where you're sticking your finger and you don't want that. So you want it, you want your existence, your experience with FileMaker. Instead of being a knife, it's nice and smooth and it's rounded so it doesn't snag things, right? And so Claris has been investing pretty heavily in WebDirect and Go to make sure that they snag less. I think the, I use the word suck less, right? Because that's always, uh, it's uh, one of the best live streams I've ever seen was never assume your software is great and wonderful. Just assume it sucks. And then then strive to have it suck less. Marketing and salespeople kind of hate that, but if you take that pack as an engineer, a developer, or a product manager, then you're always looking, you're looking for the friction points. You don't assume your product's great. Assume it has friction points. Find the friction points and sand them off and make them happy, right? This fundamental kind of mental concept. I was about to stick myself with the knife. That'd be bad. So this tool here allows you to evaluate various things in the FileMaker platform. And one side over here, this is running in, this is, Pro running over here on this side. This is Pro 23 and this is Go 23. And of course, you can see the differences. And so we could spend hours going through this, um, but we want to talk about like sleep and restore. The whole idea back in the day was that where did you know, you notice that if you have a laptop and you move from office to office, then and then you change networks, it reconnects. Right. That's a new feature that all came from the work from FileMaker Go because they had to build it for FileMaker Go because people got tired of trying to reconnect with their iPad because they would go in and out of cellular, in and out of Wi-Fi or change networks. And Claire's employees built it into Pro. The engineers built it into Pro so they wouldn't have to keep reconnecting going from office to office. So it didn't matter that we were snagging our we were getting knifed, the customers were getting knifed, the engineers were like, screw this. And they built this into the product so they didn't have to deal with it, right? So I will take a win any which way you want to address that. Put lipstick on the pig. A win is a win. Doesn't matter why is in so much as that it was fixed. So there's, so you can click on each of these. Oh, I'm seeing, I click on this one. I'm going to click over here on this one. And then I'm going to come over here on this one. I'm going to press the button. And then, so there's this conversation of under the hood and restore. Then there's this uh, conversation and, and none of this has really changed at all. Um, I'm unaware. Uh, in fact, I'll, old behavior called hibernation, et cetera, et cetera. There is this sleep restore demo. There's also this conversation. If I hit next down at the bottom, can't see it down here. Let me bring this up. Now, there you go. Bottom right is the next. So you can slide through these topics left to right. But the best thing to do is play it on Pro or run the app on Pro and then also run the app in Go and, go and compare side by side. For example, huge issue. Biomakers uh, sharing. Margaret, you ran this the other day. We we're talking about sharing, right? Uh, security. You can have security settings that are specific to the user on the file, but then you have if a FMP12 file is running, how can it be shared? So the they're, they're called extended privileges. FM app 
It's all it always starts with FM, and then app is the is the privilege set that regulates Pro and Go. There's FM Web Direct, which regulates Web Direct connectivity. FM Reauthenticate is right here on screen. And once again, I could click on it over here. Um, once again, the the material is the same, but then we do a demo of behavior, so you can actually play with it and see how it works, right? So you can compare how this will behave as opposed to how the pro will behave. So that's the idea. It educates you, then you get to test it and go, oh, right? Like you have customers, like like I have a customer that'll like click on something and they'll and they'll and they and it zooms up like this, and they're like, Richard, what the? F so the idea is that's what they said, and 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 the problem is is that iOS or operating systems, if you double uh, click on a mobile device, as a zoom in to find something you're interested in, when you're actually trying to press a button that you couldn't hit because the button was too small, right? So so that that's a thing in here, like talking about zoom and locking the zoom. So if they miss the button, it just doesn't go like jumbo stupid, and then they can get mad at you, right? So this is quick time. I'm hooked up with a lightning connector over here. This is the local copy here. So FM might reauthenticate. If you don't put FM reauthenticate, at all in your solution. Like if I come over here to the local solution and I go file, manage, security, and I look at like the admin and I say advanced settings. And Margaret, you can give this file away, right? They can have this file. Uh, you can come over here to uh, admin right here. And then these are the extended privileges. So FM reauthenticate is this one right here. Require a reauthentic after. It's, a, it's actually FM reauthenticate is a title, this one kind of interesting it doesn't really say it well maybe if i make the window bigger there it is yeah okay, okay here so. we go yeah so they wrote a book and it doesn't rent whatever fine good enough so make the screen bigger and reauthenticate is off so so here's here's essential things one fm reauthenticate zero is what you want to use if you're got nuclear missile secrets stealth bomber stuff if you're a hospital and you got hipaa th things that requires that if the machine sleeps at all you come back in you have to re-authenticate now the re-authenticate might maybe nothing more than your fingerprint on the laptops i love the fingerprint thing on the new apple laptop top right corner re-authenticates you could also do your face try to do your face or whatever that's kind of hit and miss so that will help you rate this so re-authenticate can be done easily but some places you really 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 want to force a re-authentication with a username and password this helps with that so zero gives you no grace period 10 is kind of a normal one they put. So they put these two ones in here as examples. And then so then, then of course, on this on the real FileMaker certification, which has been deprecated, the super hard test, um, they would say, hey, what happens in the re-authenticate if someone hasn't selected one of these two items? What is the setting? So if you don't t turn either of these on, Margaret, what would be the FM re-authenticate setting that FileMaker would use? If you so, don't turn wait, if you don't turn either of them on? Mm-hmm. I mean, um, really, FM reauthenticate zero is no. You have to authenticate immediately. And 10 waits 10 minutes, and you can go up oh, to a week. I assume it doesn't reauthenticate unless you close and reopen the file. Okay, okay. well, that, yeah. Reauthenticating is, reauthenticating is putting your username and password in. If you can get past it with your face or a fingerprint, that's good enough. Well, you can disable those things, but. Well, no, I'm, uh, okay, because I'm confused. Because I, I thought you were asking what if it does if you don't turn either of these on, right? Because when I use BVA okay, and Go. Okay, back up. If I uh, these files are set for guest access, so I can't demonstrate this. But if you have a FileMaker file, and you uh, you open it up for the first time, you authenticate, and yeah. it's admin, and then one two three four like a password we use in a lot of demos. Then you close the file, yes, or you change networks, and it comes back and it reauthenticates. It you're gonna be worst case expected to put in admin and one two three four. That is reauthentication. Authenticate zero means. Uh, uh, zero, I mean, there's no, I mean, zero is the highest level of security. If you exit, you're going to have to put in every time. So this is no grace period at all. There's nothing harder than that. It's zero. Yeah. And what I was saying is that currently BVA, I don't think has either enabled. So when I go off to other apps and I come back, as long as the file is still open, I don't have to re-enter a password. That's if not true. Can... Oh, if it's okay. set for zero. So FM reauthenticate zero. By default, neither one of these will be turned on. The default behavior for FileMaker, uh, and it's not in here, it's in the help, is FM reauthenticate one. You get one minute. Oh. Now, if you come back to your computer and you've added it to the keychain, it's not going to ask you because you told the computer to reauthenticate on your behalf by the keychain.
With iOS apps, you can limit the amount that the keychain can work because iOS apps are prone to being dropped, left, stolen, leave them in a taxi, flush them, drop people, drop them in toilets all the time. So that's FMR Authenticate. So zero. Uh, we have a question. Ten. Go ahead, question. Both re-authenticates have to be checked? Question mark. No, it's whatever. If you have multiple that are open and it sees multiple in different ones, like we could add a new one in here. We could totally add a new uh, FMR Authenticate. You'd have to go in here and add it. I got to remember how to do that. Uh, but you can add an extended privilege in here, right? But it the, tells you I, in the bottom little corner to add, edit, or delete extended use privileges. Use tools in the extended privileges tab. Use the tools in the extended privileges tab. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's where you would set up. So those are the ones. So that list is this list over here. But you could create a new one. And all you have to do is use the exact uh, same spelling over here. See that? You do that. But you could put 60 on there yourself. So here's the deal. You can turn on any of them, all of them, none of them. It's going to take the most pessimistic one that applies to that user, and it's going to enforce the most pessimistic security. So if you put 10 and 5, it's going to always, uh, it'll let people come back in without credentials up to five minutes, okay? But it can be 0, 1, up to a week, which is 1,400, or 14, 11,014 minutes, whatever it is. It's a big number. A week of minutes. I don't normally think about things like that. But you can have it live for a week without credentials. The rub is, is that most of us will save it even on Windows in a keychain, so we already re-authenticate that way, if that makes sense. But this is an important one to think about. So I'm going to go to usability up here real quick, because usability becomes one that we uh, deal with all the time. All right, so there's usability on this one. So uh, when entering a layout, go, right? So we'll just click on this one real quick. When you enter a layout, I can go to almost use the whole screen. Bah, 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 Yeah, so this gets back in this idea of locking the screen, things like that. Um, Go will auto resize right frequently. So you need to think about this. So if I come back over here and I go to the inner and go and left out, then I can actually try it. So I can run the script over here. What happens? It's going to open something or do whatever it's going to do. There it goes. It's probably a big interface with a bunch of objects on it. So it's probably freaking out about that. So you're using FM Go. So the screen did a 25% zoom because it filled with. So this is four three or four different interfaces here. So it, it, it makes stuff on the iPad actually pretty small, right? Does that make sense? So you see that? Um, and, th and then, so those are all real objects in here. So that's why there's no fields really, but that's why all these objects were shot down to the pad. So then you could actually set it for a hundred percent and and not allow it to resize, right? So once again, that way someone comes to the screen and they get an experience that is what they expect, right? Does that make sense, Margaret? The auto shrinky dink moment, right? Yeah. So what you said is a script somewhere and it would control what Do size that. the layout would appear? By default. Okay. So the short version is that this is the iPad. If I'm going to run the script right here, I'm going to press run. It shrinks everything down. Okay. Get that? Um, because the zoom wasn't locked at 100%. I hit okay. I hit okay. I come back out. Now you would test the same script. That's why this tool is so great. You run on pro. We press it here. Okay, so the idea was perform the script. So when you enter layout, zoom auto to fit the whole thing. Pro doesn't do that, right? That, that doesn't do that at all, right? That's the idea. So if you come over here, run the script, it locks it. So the idea is that you want to lock your interface, right? I'm not sure why pro right here. I'd have to look at that script. But essentially, when you jump layouts in FileMaker Pro, the zoom level doesn't change. Go will automatically auto zoom arbitrarily because it likes to do that. So what you have to do is you have to run a script that, that says zoom level 100% and you lock it. That keeps this double pinchy. See how it kind of got big there over there and then you're trying to, on the side over there. That's my, you want to lock that so it doesn't do that. So so once again, we're talking, we're talking about zoom, right? I, I would run both these side by side. Yes. Pro and go to play with them. Set the zoom level at 100%, lock it for yes. consistent behavior with pro, okay? Yes. Uh, Apple doesn't do this because the behavior on iOS is different than Mac OS, but you're dealing with people who are going to be doing pro stuff and then they're going to go to go stuff like these people in the hangar. If, if the interface changed a lot, they'd freak out, right? So you don't want that sort of behavior change. So let's see, let's go down usability. Let me just get the next one here. Uh, touch keyboard state, right? So the touch toggle the keyboard, touch keyboard is enabled. I'm going to hit the next down there. So it talks about the you can spawn, 
right? Once again, if I okay. Once so, again, I would run this locally. You can, if I'm on the iPad over here on the left, I can click into a field. I don't get a keyboard. Okay. If I click, if I hit the button to toggle the keyboard, keyboard will be visible. I click on it. The keyboard pops up. You can specify the kind of keyboard you get. It could be a numeric keypad. It could be something designed for an email address or something like that. Um, all these things come up. So we're just kind of cruising through on these, talking about stuff, uh, talking about, uh, you know, uh, copy paste, how things work. Um, once again, pop up menus, not pop up menus here. We come over here, you get this yes or no thing, right? Remove selection, you click on that, click on that. So, you, so it's going to teach you about all these little subtle behavioral differences that you need to be aware of if you're a, uh, if you're building an iOS application. Okay. Calculation scripts, container fields, web viewers, printing PDFs. That's another one that's always fun. So all these topics are here. So once again, this tool is really a really excellent tool to play with. It talks about the printing limitations go only, for example, right? So printing limitations. Printing in, the, in WebDirect is a bit of a hack. That's WebDirect. So this is a conversation about WebDirect. Yeah. So once again, this gets back to the WebDirect. Someone was complaining about WebDirect printing. Um, WebDirect doesn't, we can't really print. Um, go can print. Um, it's more useful than... Uh, WebDirect. WebDirect is a browser, remember? So browsers don't wrote low resolution fundamentally, right? So um, whenever you tell WebDirect to print, you know, the FileMaker server is printing for you and then sending you a PDF. That's how that works. So someone was kind of agitated, but that's kind of been the way that browsers work since the dawn of time. It's never really changed. And it's not up to even Apple to change that. If you wanted to have browsers behavior change, you'd have to get with Google. Because I think if you push that a dog's tail or tail wagging the dog that would it would change the direction of the dog but you'd have to get google to do it and probably microsoft and then you could get the rest of everyone else to follow along with that so print how to print go only we have that topic up here go back over here pdfs and printing go only so it talks about how this works in go right there's a print print feature supported um some features are supported some features are not supported right and then WebDirect is a bit of a hack. Once again, we talk about that. Let's talk about uh, spacing issues. That's text. Is it usability? Is it, uh, I'm trying to figure out where that would be. It talks about um, supported fonts. Oh, yeah, this is a good one here. Supported fonts, supported styles, right? So if I click on that list, and then I come over here, and I go to text usability. Or am I in? I'm in text editing. Sorry, text editing. Supported fonts, supported styles. These are different, right? These are can be very different. So notice on this screen over here, we're in Pro. It actually, all these are showing up correctly. Um, so let me come over here. One, two, three, and hit text styles. Notice over here on the right, they don't have not changed, right? So there's another little, you know, there's little things that pop up, right? Interesting, eh? Questions from anyone? This is like gold if you're doing a lot of ghost stuff. Uh, just someone mentioning that they personally needed Zoom because of uh, vision issues, so which makes sense. No, I get all that. It, it, it's it's mostly a behavioral. The issue, from my perspective, it's a behavioral change. So someone learns how to use it on Mac or Windows on a laptop, then they take it to an iPad, and they get frustrated because they, you know, it gets back to buttons. Where's the uh, usability? Is the button issue? Oh, let's um. <laughs> I keep clicking on the wrong one. Let's see. Support styles, autocomplete, miscellaneous text editing, drop down behavior, import with pro. The import and export, supported import and exports are a little different. Take my word for that. Where would I have? Is it under usability? Oh, yeah. Touch keyboard states. You can talk about that one real quick. Switching layouts doesn't appear in the layout menu. Yeah, the placement of uh, control. So understand and in, in go. Like the tap market we ran this yesterday, we were wrestling with the little A, the formatting tool bar. Yeah. When you're in pro, all the toolbars are up here. If I say view status toolbar, it's at the top. And there's a couple little extra items here, but then there's the formatting bar right here. They're all at the top. When you go with go, the bars are uh, top and bottom, right? That's another one that kind of pops up they can get you right so uh let me just go through these and see what we got next 
on object uh, script triggers can be sometimes the next and previous buttons are not trapped for that. How to fix the problem. Oh, users may be frustrated when they attempt. This is that Zoom, unauthorized Zoomy thing, right? So this is where you can lock the Zoom, right, Margaret? Of course, if you're on an iPad and you have readability issues, then please zoom in. That's fine. This is one of those things that where it, if you don't do anything, it can cause confusion. Listen, my phone is ringing when people got pissed about this. I mean, I'm dealing with some people over here that pulled the plug out of the back of the computer because they got to a card stand window they couldn't get out of, right? So <laughs> I'm being serious. They got they looked at me and they said, yeah, we pulled the, the plug out of the computer because we were stuck in FileMaker. We couldn't get out. And they, they weren't stuck. They just didn't see the little checkbox in the corner of the Cardsdale window. So uh, sort records is there. I'm looking for the button size. Remember, you and I have done button size before on stuff, Margaret. I'm wondering. Well, about... there means like a chunk about we talk about button size because to me, like the button size conversation is you just make them bigger, right, for fingers, or is that a different? Yeah, I know, but we, it gets to a point where we provide some guidance on what probably bigger should be. Can Take a sense. look at it itself. So calculations. There's a little bit of variation in calculation. Get platform. Get the device screen dimensions just gest oh gesture tap this one's awesome so gesture tap is triggers a run so you can say get gesture tap so you can uh, capture for like one tap i just one tap i'm gonna do two taps see the two taps right there so you can't see my finger i'm beating on it here i'm gonna use two fingers two taps and then if you do two fingers twice it doesn't it doesn't detect that so it's it's limited in how far it'll really go, but it's pretty neat. Um, it does do some things. So it's get trigger gesture info. Okay. Another one that comes up is the window rotating. Like if I rotate the window, then it looks like that. And things are chopped off and whatnot. It used to be that you'd build an app and you would lock it, lock the perspective. And Apple, I don't know, ten years ago, got on a real rampage about making sure that every app that was approved for the app store would not lock the orientation it was a feature that if you used it it was in there you could turn it on if you used it they looked down upon that unless you had a really great reason for not allowing that um and so what happened is that we needed a trigger that would tell us we had no way of in firemaker used to be on rotate right and they got rid of that right it was so that there's a trigger now that's called on if you're on the layout mode you come over here it's on on layout size change. Okay, so this is great. So you're on on layout size change, and if you rotate it, see. Oh, so, you need I'm to sorry. bring the go window to the front yep, again. Let's try that again. So you just successfully. Did you hear the beep? Probably not. I'm gonna turn it back. There we go. So you, you because it's firing a script, you could detect which way you're rotating. It's not a rotation. It's it, it's noticing that the the length and the width of the layout, the, the vertical height has changed and the uh, lateral width has changed as well. They swapped. So the, the total real estate is the same, right? But uh, but it's but the numbers have changed and where they're showing up. So once again, I'll rotate. It rotates and says, oh, yeah, you changed. And that, that's where you would change a layout if you need to or scold the person, don't turn your screen or whatever you want to do. It's your app. So it talks about this. Um, if you manage to actually, it's the same thing on Pro over here. If you come over here, so it's under calculations, what kind of calculations, uh, screen dimensions. So what happens here is that if I do that, oh, you hear, have you, I don't know if you heard the beep or not. You hear the click on that? No. Let me do, so let me try it again. Okay. And oh, so it's considered the same thing as changing window size. So you are changing the window size on Pro on. It's 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 not it, okay. Here's what I say: changing the window size. People think, well, you didn't change the square. Like if I rotate this over here, mm -hmm. you didn't change the square inches of real estate space. Okay, it's not that kind of calculation. It's calculating that if if I'm over here and I don't see, you can see me on the screen, and I rotate the 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 height here is smaller. Now the height there is going to be bigger, and it's detecting that the height and width changed. That's what it's doing. Okay, yeah, it's so not detecting. What, you, would would Windows script triggers work then for orientation changes? Yeah, but it's 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 over here. But you can't change orientation on the computer so much. What you, you're changing the size, right? Yes. Okay, and if you change it, you can change it to it's a perfect square, and it'll give you a, a different message. 
-hmm. right? Kind of weird, but yes, you have to see how that works. So, so it's the same thing. So if someone's like your, I mean, as well as scripts I've never used on pro, it makes perfect sense to go, but on pro it's like, so I'm going to resize the window. I don't want a micro. I was like, oh, you did do the right thing. Right. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what how that would affect a user. I mean, leave it Nick to figure that out. Right. But it's like, and it maybe you don't have to enter. Here's the thing. They could resize the window. And you don't have to get in their face with a dialogue. You could just do something. Right. But I, but the trick is, is that, well, say they do this and they only can see this now. Right. What is it? You know, they do this and then oh, I can't read it. So you come out here. Then what do you do? Right. So then. Oh, but I left the I left that layout. These are this this solution is a bunch of layouts, so everyone understands. Oh. So they're see, so that way we can program and do. Yeah, David suggested you'd use that uh, script trigger to go to another layout, so a layout designed for the rotation, I guess. On on Pro, on a correction on Go on iPhone or iPad, yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. But on the Mac or on Windows. So anyway, yeah, I mean, and then, of course, you could have if you had a Microsoft tablet that ran full Windows. So you're running Pro, FileMaker Pro and Windows on a tablet. Then if someone rotated the stuff, it would trigger there. So that would work on that. I don't, I've never used a, a tablet like that on the Windows side, but that's where that would be useful. So, I mean, does anyone find this interesting? This is like really like basic homework stuff. And it, it hasn't changed. And we haven't updated this this solution in five years. There's nothing in there that's really changed. Uh, the beacon support, that was always kind of sketch. We're in scripting now. Replace field content, send mail is a little different. Uh, pop over window. Okay. Uh, there's also a script set close pop over to program. Close a pop over once the test is complete. So once again, it's the, the reason we're... Uh, Pop up windows are fully compatible with ProGo and WebDirect. Okay, so I'm not sure why we'd have. Normally, what we're trying to do is bring out the items in here that have changed. This probably had been something that was different at some point, and then it then FileMaker got into compliance. Claris got into compliance uniformly the same. See, so like here's the thing: there's a lot of things in here, but all everything that I'm listing in here either currently has a behavioral difference between Pro and Go, or it used to have a behavioral difference. Um, and once again, we're also showing some web direct in here, so it might be that as well. So go back to scripts, go back to scripting. I'm just looking at the list here. Select all, pop over window, new window script step. So, uh, Margaret, would you like to try to teach everyone if they if you can do this? And then we'll do the local notification. That's interesting too. Can you explain to people what a single document interface and why does it matter? And so first explain to me what FileMaker Pro is on Mac and Windows. Then how that's different than Go, and then I will cover the web direct one, which is even harder. Single document interface. Single, I want to say window interface. How about single window interface? If I'm in FileMaker Pro over here, I can have this window. I can have another window here, right? And you can see all these at the same time, right? Yes. On FileMaker Go, assuming you're not doing any of the weird split screen stuff, you're going to see only one window at a time, right? Yes. So if I click the top on the menu bar with my mouse, I'm going to click right here. You can't see my finger. I'm going to click on it. One, two, three, click. Then it comes down and I say, I want to open a new file, right? So if I press the plus button, if I press the plus button, it's going to spawn a duplicate window, right? So I have a duplicate window and I can select which one I want to see. So you can pick whichever one, okay? You could also then be in FileMaker and you could come down and say, I want to go to the launch center and open another solution. So go to a hosted solution, go to local solutions, favorite, my apps, open the built-in contact solution that Nick made for Claris way back in the day. So now this is running. So if I click up here at the top, then I've got that window and that window and that window and that window. Okay. Do they still all act like pro windows? That's kind of what I wanted to ask you about the other day when I was having issues with windows. That's why we're having this conversation because I knew this was kind of weird for you, right? So, so they are is still it like there. A hidden window, like because you yes, know when... yes, you just can't see them at the same time. But you okay. can call if you call it the same. You can call it the same, and then and they will pop up and do the behavior is the same. But here you can actually see a foreground window. This one's in the foreground. You can see the one in the background. That's exactly the same as over here, but there's two that are side by side, right? Okay. So then I have a question about Pro Windows kind of related to this then. Because in Pro, okay. you can have 
a window that exists but is not technically visually available on your screen if you like go to like yeah you can give windows, it negative space and have it fly off the side correct and it's and then if you go to windows it's like oh this window technically exists but it's not physically been opened for you um okay that's different that's different so let's talk about that so so we when you open a solution like let's say we open a basic solution over here i'm not going to close this one and open it up but i'm going to open this solution up we open this up, it pops a window because the startup script runs, it pops a window, okay? This is, that's an explicit window that is open. If this has a relationship attached to it, to another file, right? Remember when we talked yesterday, we we're doing the, the data movement back and forth with the phone app? We didn't have a relationship between the two of them. We did it with a script. Because if I'm over here and I'm doing stuff and for some reason it wants to it looks at the relationships and it thinks it needs something it will go find the other related files it will secretly behind the scenes open them and they will be open and they will be hidden right here under show window these are implicitly open windows not explicitly open explicit means that you double clicked it you want it to pop up implicitly means that FileMaker behind your back was like hey, it's good key. yeah yeah and Clarice is talking yeah they won't even notice screw those guys right and they open the window behind your back okay that's an implicit open. Okay. FileMaker will do that behind your back. If you program it with a script, unless the script is called, it will never spawn the other window. But I, what you don't want is, like most time, if you're on a network and you have a, a server that's in the office and everything's like kind of steady, steady, ready, kind of you know easy to predict, then having it open them in the background and implicitly is fine. But if you're out on the road and you have a local file here, and then it goes, hey, it's opening a file on the server. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, he won't notice. Yeah. Right? So then it opens it. And then you're running around. Then suddenly you get this beach ball. And you're like, what the? What? And you don't understand because it's trying to communicate with the window that's hidden. Okay. But you can't see that. Got it. So are all Go windows considered explicit windows or the ones that you no, can't see? No, they're implicit the or explicit. It does either one. I, and, and when you're over here. Off the top of my head, I don't. Does someone here know the answer to that? These are normally explicit windows, but it will it go. Listen, Go works really. So understand that Go came from Pro, and as a result, the fundamental behavior, whether it shows it to you or not, is the same. Okay. Okay. So I, there I should be implicit windows, and I'm not off the top of my head and sure where they're going to be. So if I go over here to that menu, my guess is they probably pop down there in that other window. We'd have to set up a relationship here and pop it. And then they'd probably be down there with a little indicator on them that they're uh, implicitly opened. Okay. Okay. Got it. But that means that every window in Go is explicit other, unless otherwise hiding in the menu somewhere, theoretically. Well, it's exactly, I think you're thinking about the wrong way. I think that all, all it's, Go will only show you one window. Yes. Whether it's implicit or explicit. Now, at the moment that you tap on, say you're you're in pro over here. So the moment that you tap on, say like there's a hidden window up here. Okay, this yes. is a very important thing, and 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 it's it's implicitly open because it needed some related data, and you're like, I forgot there's even a relationship in there. You go in there and you at you select it. You have then blessed it doo -doo -doo -doo, as it being explicit. Right. So what is what happens when you open a file explicitly? What happens? The first thing that happens uh, when, startup script. Thank you very much. It's going to run the startup script. So it will implicitly open the file and not run the startup script. Oh, oh, huh. OK. <laughs> That's right? interesting. Right. Yeah. I can see your little squirrels are spinning. I imagine right that down. has some ramifications, but I don't quite understand the extent of what those ramifications would be. Well, part of what I try to do is explain to you is that in a mobile solution, especially if you have a local part of it, you don't want to have the implicit connections. That's why we were taking pictures with the mobile app. I didn't want a relationship back to the main database. I didn't want it behind your back popping open. It's back to this idea of calculation fields, like legit regular calculation fields. As your beginner, eh, that's fine. You're learning as an intermediate developer. You're going to get to a point where you're going to start realizing that they can, like summary fields or calcs, they can fire and slow things down. The other day we were with Hans and he showed how that could get out of hand real fast. One of the best live streams we've had in a very, me personally, I learned a lot, which makes it exciting for me. But you want to limit FileMaker talking behind your back, right? <laughs> and, and, and so, because you want to talk, 
only when you say go talk right now because I'm expecting it. When you're sitting there and it's beach balling, you're like, why that? Is it beach balling? You don't know. What is it a hidden summary field? Is it a hidden calculation field? Or is it a related file that it's opening that it's wrestling with? Right? Because yeah. it's implicit. Yeah, okay, right? that makes sense. This is a good conversation. This, this is an excellent conversation for intermediate to advanced developers. They need to know all this stuff. Uh, David A, explicit window is user interaction and implicit window is script automation? Question mark. Implicit windows are window are are file file their implicit window of a file that was referenced obliquely or obliquely within your solution. So if we have a mobile, I'm waving my hands over here. If you want to stop, I'll stop sharing here briefly. I'm gonna yeah. wave my hands. So mobile app, okay? It's yes. we decide it's local to take pictures. A helicopter, picture, 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 picture. It's local on here. We want high performance because we're crawling on top of it. The planes are spinning. We don't want to be distracted by a beach ball and then walk into the tail rotor while it's going. You don't want to be distracted by stupid stuff. So no beach ball. So the local file, it works good. But then if the local file has a relationship between like primary keys, it might start spinning to open up the other file. Got it. And and cause a performance hit. Or here's one. It's doing stuff. It's it's secretly behind the scenes opened up the remote file. The filemaker server decides to run a backup. I'm gonna take and we take, you know, backups happen frequently, top of the hour, right? So you're like, it's twelve noon. We're trying to hurry up. The blades are spinning, picture, 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 then beach ball. Why the hell is it beach ball and walk in the tail rotor? Okay, so once again, it's about minimizing the distractions, minimizing the friction points. Friction points lead to people walking into tail rotors. Okay. It's dumb. So once again, we're trying to control the friction points. No, that makes sense. And like, yeah, so the, the explicit versus implicit, because I think I was confused because I wasn't naming my window correctly when I was working with the. Okay, here's window. the thing. If, if, it, if, it, if it implicitly opens the window, yes, you're not going to have control of it. And here's the deal with FileMaker is my general and watch someone say monkey bread will do that for you. Probably monkey bread will fix this, but. If, if FileMaker opens a window behind your back, you, A, don't know that it's really open unless you somehow try to figure it out, and you don't know the name of the window. So if it was me, and without bringing Christian Schmidt in here and saying, well, you could murmur, murmur. But here's the thing. Monkey Bread Plugin doesn't work on Go, and it doesn't work on WebDirect overly that great so, to a degree. Once mm -hmm. again, a browser hack, right? So my thought process would be is that you – if you know that you're going to implicitly open a file, then as your file starts up, it goes and, and in a startup script says, open this other file for me. You explicitly beat it to the punch. Oh. And, it, and as you open it, you rename the window. And so you know what its name is because you, you force it to open. It's, its name is Rover 1 instead okay. of <laughs> FM 2020 tool copy cloned recovered whatever someone's file. Okay. Got it. So instead Give of letting the file makers slink out the back door, you tell it you know it's going to a party. Okay. You tell it in advance it's going to the party and you're going to name the party, right? In advance. That <laughs> way it's there. So you're all upfront about it. Now, when you do that, it's going to run the startup script. So you need to have your thought process about if you can put like a little flag in there to tell it, like you tell it, you, you wouldn't just say open the file, you'd call a script in the other file. Mm -hmm. When you call the script in the other file, you can pass a parameter. But I don't know if the startup script can read the parameter. I don't think startup scripts can receive parameters. You have to figure that out, play with that. But the point is that you can tell that window to spawn and give it a specific name that you know, that you've written down, that you keep track of. So here's WebDirect. Imagine, so here's I. So so here's WebDirect. WebDirect works the same way. So here we are. So we're like, we're imagine we're in a browser on WebDirect. Yeah. And I can click up here and I can show you this option right here, okay? Imagine the same as Go, it's in a browser, and this isn't, and this right here is not available at all, zero. Oh, so wait, can you not have multiple windows open? In you can. They're there. They're to it's like a, a stealth Romulan battle wait, cruiser Wait, so are thing. all of them implicit on WebDirect? No, no, they're explicit and implicit the same, but, they're, but you cannot, but you there's no way them. to see them. How do you see them on <laughs> Pro or Go? You go over here, you say, show uh, the explicit ones will be down here. Yeah. And and on Windows, a little similar but different. The implicits will be over here. Should say explicit, implicit. Over here, uh, they're kind of mixed together on the screen right here, right? Where you have these, right? And then on WebDirect, 
They're there, but they're completely cloaked and you have no way of decloaking them unless you can call them. Say, go to this window. So uh, you'd have to name every single window so you could call them. Well, or, 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 or most direct? solutions that handles it for you automatically because a file maker. So you call a script in that file. Mm -hmm. When you call a script in that file, that file becomes active and whatever the most frontmost window it had will pop forward. It does it for you automatically. It's handled all automatically, right? But if you have five windows that are open, like you keep saying, like you can programmatically say new window. Yes. And then, but on, but in, in Go, you'd only see it in that split screen with the dialogue. But in WebDirect, you're not going to see them at all. We can play with this when we get into WebDirect. But see how that works? Yes. So we have this is this window management issue. It's a big, for advanced developers, a big deal. For beginning, it's handled auto, ma auto magically. You don't have to worry about it. In intermediates, it's auto magical. But as you get to be a senior person, you're like, like me, I didn't want the, the little uh, the app spinning while they're trying to take photos of a spinning you know tail rotor which could you know chop heads off we have right? two questions mm -hmm. uh implicit normally is out of the screen that is opened by a script yeah or a relationship so somehow it knows a relationship there and it might need it so it's going to go try to see it what's on the other side of the relationship oh this is an interesting question you know like the windows that you open by yeeting them off like a thousand points to the left are off-screen open windows in Pro visible in the Go overview? Okay, stop one second. Stop. I'm going to go back to the previous question. I got that one wrong. If you call a script to another file, that's an explicit period. It's still hidden on, on WebDirect, totally hidden on WebDirect, and it's semi-hidden. It's in that interface in, in, in Go. A relationship spawn is implicit. If you if you call a script that's pretty deliberate, okay, you may not know that you did it, may not know that line of code's in there, but you call the script and the script contain that. Does that make sense? So, what's the other question? The other question is: Are off-screen open windows in Pro visible on Go Overview? Uh, yeah, we could probably write one in here real quick. You want to try that real quick? Yeah, that'd Let's be an interesting it. discussion. I didn't even think about so that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this window. I'm going to, I'm going to put this back over here, actually. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of these by hitting the little red X with my left hand. So I only got one window right here and I'm on this. Let me go to the home screen. So I'm going to go to the home screen on that. I'm going to come over here. Now this, now this is one of those rare moments where peer to peer hosting is applicable, right? Oh, we're going to turn it on. I've never seen it turned on. It's been running. Uh, we can talk oh. about that sometime. But yeah, I'm hosting this file here. That's why the network takes a burp when it sends a lot of data. Oh, um, I was wondering why it was like. I'm hosting here. So if I make a change here, so if I get, if I say script workspace, if I say create a new script, I'm going to say, what do we want to do? We want it to spawn a, what was it? A request? new window that goes off screen for a. Uh, yeah. Computer. So let's say new window. Let's say uh, new window. Current, let's say current layout. Let's say negative height and width to say, let's say it's, well, this is fun. You can say height and width, but that won't do anything for web director or, or, or go because they're forcibly size out, right? Mm -hmm. But I can say the position, let's say negative a thousand. Oh, negative, that's a minus key. Okay, I'm not seeing that. What oh, is you know, happening? it's <laughs> there <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's there. This is monkey <laughs> bread. I have coloring problems with this oh, computer monkey oh, bread. Oh, got it. Okay. I was very so I confused. Put, I have a uh, you, you double negative. Zero. Okay. Yeah. So negative thousand. So that would be up to the left side and up way off, right? Negative yeah. thousand, negative thousand, right? I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to turn this on to a new button. I'm going to say save. Now I'm going to come over here and I'm going to see if I can find the script for this, wherever that would be. It should be in like the selectable scripts, right? Scripts. New window, window down there. It's the very yeah. bottom, right? One, two, three, go. Okay, so it flashed. It, it flashed. Okay, so let's hang on. Did Let it me transition? Hit the top. Yeah, I think it did. So we'll, here's what we're going to do is I'm going to um, name gonna, the window, I'm maybe? Adjust it again. So that's the thing. This is this go thing, right? So let me go back to script workspace. And I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to give it a name Stealth Window. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna save it. Here, switch back over to this mode right here. So if I go up here at the top, I have one window and the title's up there at the top. 
I'm going to click back on it. I'm going to say top left corner, click that, come down to scripts. It's going to show me all the scripts that are illuminated. I'm going to hit new window. One, two, three, press, release. Oh, it yeah. takes you to the still window. So it doesn't yeah, matter it, that you it put doesn't, it off <laughs> Yeah, during scripting, you could probably do that and like freeze it so it doesn't flashy. Do the flashy thing. Once again, it's a minimum black reference, but the flashy thingy, right? You start. I mean, if you do that enough, you have someone who's got epilepsy, you could have an epileptic fit and have them fall over. Not good. So understand that it's not so much like Claris when now. I mean, Claris is over the years doing better now. I think that's the thing. Like, what are they thinking? This is not them. This is a function limitation of mobile devices and web, right? And so uh, they, the FileMaker Pro experience is as wonderful as it can get. And then they kind of, they, they try to still extend this auto magically into to the browser with WebDirect and with uh with go and mostly it works mostly it's automatic and mostly you don't have to worry about it but uh if you mark if you want to share the uh share the um the link on this file so they can download their own link that would be yes great. i will reshare the link i shared it earlier but i will reshare again hello everybody ba -ba -ba. admin no password it should cool. be share admin the link no password with everyone so you can yep admin no password and then uh and then just once again, the best benefits to play with it in Pro and then also go side, side by side. It's designed for the iPad. It's not designed for a phone. Once we're back to this, like, I want everything on the phone. And then people don't really, you build it for them, and then they don't use it because the screen's too small. Right? So that's why we just do limited things like pictures and a signature capture, and that would be about it. There's not yep. a lot. All right. That's it for today. All right. All right, everybody. You have a good one. We will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Filemaker license. Uh, well, it's potentially expired. Look at the back of that car right there. Looks like the Filemaker license has expired. Sir, I need you to step out of the vehicle. Sir, sir, step out of the vehicle. Sir. Oh,